the present structure of the Fed and the people there, there's no chance that they're going to figure out how to do the right thing. They're completely bereft of financial history. You'd have to make them all read a handful of really solid financial history books to understand how these things work to maybe get them to appreciate trying to do the right thing. They're all running on the applause meter, just like Greenspan. They like to give up, make these speeches and move markets and get yucks. I mean, they're despicable in life. I mean, the damage they've done is immense. Bill Fleckenstein, founder and president of Fleckenstein Capital. It is so great to welcome you back to the show and great to see you again, Bill. Thanks for taking the time. Well, you say that with such enthusiasm, Julie. It makes me feel good. Well, I mean it. And you were a huge hit when we had you back on in April. And selfishly, I'd love to get you on more often just because you are someone whose name comes up often in guest requests. And so I always know that my audience is going to be thrilled to have you. And a lot has happened since we had you. Um, we had the Fed cut rates last week. Um, you know, we always start with the big picture, more of that macro view where we are today. And I know the Fed is something that you look at. It's important when you have that macro picture. So I was hoping we could start there with that big picture macro view. And as you know, Bill, on this show, you can take all the time you need to set the table. Okay. Uh, I can't remember exactly which month it was when we spoke last. April. <laughs> April, okay. But I, I know uh, that was interesting because that was not too long after the Fed hinted that they might be willing to start thinking about or cutting rates. And uh, my hair got on fire because I thought, you know, this this this, this was going to be a mistake. Um, and it's not necessarily a, a mistake if you say, well, well, geez, it seems like the economy's not as strong as it was. It's a mistake from a signaling and uh, perspective, and also um, uh, uh, shows, in my opinion, the, the the lack of understanding that they really have about inflation. They don't understand asset inflation or inflation. Um, um, but what I'm excited about was I, when we spoke then, um, I'm sure I laid out my case for the fact that I always thought that the end of this, what I call the activist central bank era, which started with Greenspan in the early to mid 90s, was going to end in the following way, that the bond market would take away the printing press. And when I say that to people, they, they go, what do you mean the bond market's going to take away the printing press? And what I mean by that is, if you're a central bank and ride to the rescue anytime you have a financial problem, a deficit issue, a banking problem, an economic problem, stock market problem, then, then you've always got a way to maybe be bailed out and, 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 and turn the markets around. However, if it was just that easy, there would never be any problems because banks, I mean, central banks would just print money forever, which they kind of done, and uh, and they would get away with it. However, at some point, if you become reckless, which I think seeing our budget deficit go from low 20 trillions to about 35 trillion and ripping higher, you know, by a couple more trillion a year, thanks to the irresponsibility of the, of the Congress and the administrations of the last 10 years or so, 12, um, if you try to monetize your way through recklessness, what you, what happens is one of two things. Your currency weakens. People have seen that all through the developing world and um, um, and or your bond market weakens. Usually if the currency weakens, the bond market does too. In this case, since the F, in the FX world, the major currencies are all run by the same kind of people with the same kind of thoughts. You know, maybe now the BOJ from Bank of Japan is doing something slightly different, but the rest are all easing, are going to be easy. Um, um, it, it's really hard for the dollar to go down hard against these other paper currencies. That's one of the reasons why gold has done so well, because people have sort of figured out it's a def default currency. I always felt that the way that, that this, like I say, activist central bank period would end would be when the bond market doesn't cooperate when the Fed cuts rates. So what happened? Last week, they basically surprised us with 50. Not that they didn't telegraph it, but just, you know, three weeks ago, people weren't really thinking about 50 basis points. So what's happened since then? Well, on Tuesday, the 10-year was yielding. I wrote it down this morning. It was yielding about 364. Now it's closer to 380. So the Fed cut short rates 50 basis points, and the 10-year now yields 15 basis points more, i.e. The, the price of the bond went down. Now, that's only four days or five days of trading. And so it's possible to have 
it, it, in all likelihood, it's just noise, you know, people selling the news. However, if this were to persist for a while, like over three to six months, where and let's say the Fed cuts again, like 25, and the bond market still doesn't cooperate, to me, it's the bond market finally saying, no, no, we don't trust you guys anymore. And we're going to demand a higher yield because of the uncertainty the, uh, that your policies may uh, continue to put pressure to the upside on inflation and maybe weaken the currency. And of course, then there's no there's no pressure for the Congress to, or the administration to try to do anything about the out of control spending here in America. So I think <clears throat> we're we're kind of at a pretty big moment. I don't mean I don't mean this minute when we sit here. I mean over the next couple of quarters where we can see if maybe we're 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 at a very big inflection point in terms of central banks' ability to drive markets the way they want to. If you put the Fed on the sideline, or if the Fed was being threatened by the bond market with with the following, if you guys cut again, we're going to tank. Well, you can imagine what that would do to stock prices. That might be enough to even upend the passive bid, and maybe the passive bid gets to, gets weakened for some other reasons. I know you guys all know more about the passive dip, bid now because I'm pretty sure you have Mike Green on along the way. Right. I saw that. Um, and uh, so it, it'll have implications for the stock market, particularly if the stock market is too extended vis-a-vis the passive bid. So that's kind of to catch you up to speed on the macro. I still think we're in a stagflationary kind of a period. Um, and uh, we'll just kind of have to see it plays out. Obviously, the election's right in front of us, and that's going to be probably a market moving event. I can't imagine it won't be. Um, so there we are. What a great frame up, Bill. Okay. Um, you pointed out the implications of um, when the bond market is going to demand that higher yield. Do you have any sort of outlook in your thesis on how high yields might go? Is that something you've thought about or factored in? And then the implications once you start to reach you know, certain levels uh, when it comes to the yield, what that could mean? Okay. First of all, I want to make, I want to point out something you said, which is really crucial. My thesis, okay, because that's what it is. It's a thesis. And throughout my career, uh, which I've been at this over forty years now, um, when you're looking for kind of major inflection points, be, be it in an industry or even a company or, or a country or back, you, you develop a thesis, and then you start to see, oh, is the market starting to can tell me that that's what's happening? And as it does, you can start to implement it. I think for your readers that aren't professional investors and haven't been around a long time, I constantly see people that I know are very smart that I listen to on Twitter. Um, and you know, they might be wrong for three months or six months about something. And they get and and then people pile on and they hate on them. And they're missing the point. No, none of us are perfect. No one's perfect, besides maybe Stan Druckenmiller every single day and even he's not every day um and see what you what you what you need to take away from people that are more experienced than you are just ideas and try to work them in and you listen to one person another person and you put together your own theme or your own thesis or, or, or framework so um i wanted to get that that point in because i think it's really critical in terms of trying to become a better investor um as to how high rates can go well when i first got into the investment business back in the early 80s um, the rule of thumb was that the bond market ought to yield the underlying rate of inflation plus 3%. Now, are we going to go with the government's version of inflation? Are we going to go with the PCI, the CPE, you know, whatever? So I don't have a big opinion on where rates can go. I know wherever they're going to go, they're going to overshoot. That's I've seen that throughout my entire career. And if you read back through financial history, you'll see that's always the case. Big, these big macro markets, they, they overshoot in both directions. I mean, we overshot to below zero. That's pretty good for an overshoot that started at about 16% when the bond bull market began back in 1981. So I don't know how high they're going to go. I think eventually if, if people are going to be afraid of the central bankers' ability to create inflation and hurt them as fixed income investors, then, then the idea of inflation plus 2 or 3% won't be radical. Okay, is inflation three? Well, that would be five. That would be like five or six percent of the long bot. I'm not silly enough to try to say I know where the rates. If you get the direction right in fixed income or currencies or many things, that's good enough. You know, I've been uh, bullish on gold for geez twenty some years now, 
And I never really knew where it could go. Uh, you know, as we got into the 2018, 19, 20, 21 period, I thought, well, it, you know, I thought it could easily, so I thought I wouldn't be surprised if we got to 2000 or, or 2500. Here we are. I don't know. You, you don't know till you get there where it might continue to go. And I don't know. And I think if you have a too strong of opinion on, 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 on where a market or a price can get, then you might get tricked at that moment in time because things may change and and you might get too wedded to your prior idea that you knew what the exact price was supposed to be. So I would just say up. That will be very difficult for the treasury because you know we have a lot of lower, um, sorry, lower uh, coupon paper that will continue to roll off. Um, you now it kind of depends what the short rates are and depends on what they do with maturities, what, what Janet Yellen does. But higher rates are going to become a problem for the U.S. government at some point, given the size of the deficit and the fact the interest rate is, uh, I mean, sorry, the um, interest tab is at a run rate of over a trillion a year, which is bigger than defense, which is 800 billion, 800 and some odd billion. So there you go. That was always the threat along over the last years. Someday interest will be more than the, the defense budget. People thought that'd be a problem. It seems like it ought to be, but so far it hasn't been. Yeah, well, I guess so far. Um, yeah, our debt situation is, it is staggering. I want to go back to something you said um, at the top of the conversation around the Fed's rate cuts, and it shows a lack of understanding about inflation. Can we put a bit more meat on the bones there? That was interesting to me. I'd love to hear more. Okay. So, um, a lot of your readers are probably too young to know. But during the late 90s, when Greenspan got so enamored, his ego got so big and he got so enamored of getting the applause all the time and being revered, the maestro, if you'll recall, um, I w went on Bubble Vision, uh, aka CNBC, quite often and said that the Fed doesn't understand that it's fueling an asset bubble. There's all this misallocated capital and, when, and, and that will eventually the bubble will burst and there'll be lots of pain. I did a little bit of that around the uh, real estate bubble as well. Uh, and I wrote the book, uh, Greenspan's Bubbles, trying to lay out the fact that the, 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 the modern day central bankers think asset prices going up is always great, but it isn't because if it's just, if there's this distortion and the capital's misallocated, at some point that, will, that, that process will reverse itself and it'll be exceedingly painful. Now, the upside of the stocks has been warped dramatically by the passive bid, and I'm not going to waste time on that now because your readers are all experts on that, or your listeners. Um, but uh, um, the fact that they, the, the central banks got cheered for so long because the money, the, 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 the rates that were too low and the QE and the money printing and all that irresponsibleness manifested itself in higher home prices and higher equity prices and everyone felt like they're getting rich. But if it's a not natural, if it's not a natural byproduct of what the economy is capable of generating, you're just laying the groundwork for a bust. I mean, a, a rather nasty bust. And of course, the central bank is such such an activist organization, I'm speaking of the Fed, they keep writing the rescue. But it that's why it's so important to understand that if the bond market stops them, they can't ride the rescue. Then you've got these two decades of massive misallocated capital. And if that starts to unwind and go the other way, you can have a very serious problem. Now, I'm not saying it's starting tomorrow. Um, and and at some point, if we have a big enough problem in, you know, uh, in the stock market or the economy, people will think that everything's okay. But you... you you have to be aware of how you got to wherever you are in this particular moment in time and what the risks are if if, if a lot of that was sort of unnatural, if you will. Yeah. Um, when you mention a lot of that being unnatural, can you explain that? Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's go back to the dot-com craze, right? <clears throat> Greenspan kept rates too low through the 90s and we wound up with a with stock market bubble. And the, they, they topped it off with the Y2K liquidity injection in late 1999, which they subsequently redo, re, withdrew in early 2000, 2000. So 
a lot of the ideas that people had there about what the internet might be able to bring and all those kind of things, they were right. But they got to dis- they got to such high prices because of the the irresponsibility of the central bank and in a moment when people's imagination was was kind of lathered up that you created the potential for a huge accident and a lot of people got badly hurt through that. Um, I mean, stock price like Cisco dropped 70, 80%. All these big companies did. Now, 9-11 came along in 2001 and that was radically unfortunate for, for two reasons. Primarily on a personal level for the loss of lives and destruction of property and businesses and, and, and all the chaos that's now ensued, or sorry, created for our daily life having to go through TSA and all of that. But the financial um, um, part of that was it let the Fed off the hook because the unfolding recession in late 2000 and 2001 was blamed on 9-11. And it would have been blamed on the bubble that it came, that, that, that occurred, uh, that, that burst. So mm-hmm. when they started to ease to bail out the consequence of the burst bubble. It wasn't 9-11. That's not why that happened. I mean, obviously that didn't help the economy or anything, but that wasn't why the, the market was unwinding or the economy was in trouble. It's because that bubble had burst and the bubble was the economy. See, when bubbles get that big, they are the economy. Back then you had people quit their jobs to day trade and you know you had all these non-business businesses like you know party planners and dog walkers. I'm not saying there's not a need for those things, but everybody could do whatever they wanted because it was so easy to make money. And of course, that was that was that was not true, and it unwound. But it unwound in a moment in time where the the policy errors were blamed on nine eleven and not the Fed. So then the Fed starts cutting, and then they create a real estate bubble with both Bernanke and Greenspan saying you can't have a bubble in real estate because it's not arbitrageable. I'm not making this up; these are quotes. I wrote a book on this topic. So if you look at those past periods, it makes it it's hard to see sometimes when you're in something. But if you look at those past periods, you can see that those actions created bigger problems. The, 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 the housing bubble was so big and so dangerous and so re- out of control and not policed by the Fed that we almost wiped out the banking system. And we, we avoided that by all these mass, you know, by, by QE and TARP and TALF and all these bailout programs. Now, this since then the QE and and and, and all that has tended to go a, a, a lot more into equities, although other things have been dragged along, and they've been aided and abetted by the warpage in the passive bid. Well, you combine those two together, and stock prices go up like this, but the underlying value might go like this. So there's a lot of room between here and there. Now that doesn't mean it's going to reverse to reverse there immediately, but you have to be aware of what you're dealing with. As Mike Green likes to say, you have to know the rules of the game you're playing, not the game you think you're playing. This episode is brought to you by Public.com. Public.com has just announced its new bond account, offering a 6.6% yield on your investment until 2028 when the first bond matures. Here's why it's interesting. Bond yields have been at their highest levels since 2009. However, the Fed just announced its first rate cut and more are on the table. In fact, current estimates from the CME FedWatch suggest rates may fall as low as 3% by the end of 2025. The good news? Investing in a diverse portfolio of corporate and high-yield bonds could lock in today's historically high yields, even if the Fed cuts rates. That's why Public.com created the bond account. It's a new way to invest in bonds and earn a 6.6% yield on your investment for the next four to five years. Go to public.com forward slash Julia to learn how to lock in a historically high yield on your portfolio, the bond account, only at public.com forward slash Julia. Okay, let me ask you this then, Bill, um, because you are someone who has spotted bubbles um, throughout your career. Um, Would it be fair to characterize um, stocks being in a bubble or is that a bit too aggressive? I mean, again, this is... This is all make, made up rules and 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 and, 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 and determinations. I, I I think that this the the, 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 the the we have we have a we have a, a bubble is more kind of like the um uh kind of more spread around if you will in that it's not concentrated just in one place and, and a lot of the concentration in equities is a function of the passive bid which is not just pure Fed. And, and remember, a bubble's uh, this, it's the psychology and the zeitgeist and the state of mind. 
you can look back on that on the period and read stories from you know both the 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 the, the, the dot com era stock bubble and the real estate bubble. I think now it's more it, it's a bubble, but it's more a bubble in the sense of the way nineteen twenty nine might have been a bubble, in that. The, the 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 attitude back then was if you read uh, books that were written contemporaneously or ones that were written after was that you know, stocks could never really go down. I mean, it always comes back. That was the famous phrase. It always it being the market always comes back. So I think it's more of a a, a bubble in, 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 in the mind that people think you can't really lose money in, in, in the stock market, and the, the and, and and so the Fed has fostered that. Whereas the, the, the gross distortion valuation has been more a function of the passive bid, the Fed, uh, structured products and things like that. So I think it is, but it's it's not quite the same. Like when the equity bubble tipped over, the economy went with it right away. When the real estate bubble tipped over, the economy went with it, with it right away. Now we've seen the economy wobble for quite a while, but it hasn't really tipped over and gone. Part of that's because of the massive uh, budget deficit. And, 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 and um, um, so that's helped a fair bit. And, and there haven't been any really disruptive financial as accidents to affect psychology. So I, 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 I think it is a bubble, but I think it's, it's different from the, the prior two, if, if that yeah. description makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really enjoying listening to you explain this too. And I, I like, the, it's like a bubble of the mind and the psychology yes. part. Well, actually, so interesting. now that you say it that way, it's funny. Jim Grant wrote a book, I think it was in 88, called Money of the Mind. Hmm. And he tried to get at this point of how psychology impacts markets. And for your younger investors that don't know about this, you have to read financial history because then you can see over a decade or two how psychology or people's state of mind can get so can be so wrong relative to the underlying facts. Peer group pressure and FOMO are real things. Uh, we saw a great example of peer group pressure during the COVID cr- nonsense. You know where you know you could saw people were 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 all everyone knows what happens. So I'm not going to editorialize on it, but yeah. humans are herd animals, and that's what happens. We wind up you know gravitating the same sorts of ideas, and nobody wants to be the outlier, as you could see in COVID. Uh, it's the same in investing, but you can get a better uh, understanding of how how psychology impacts things because it might be easy to say, "Well, I don't believe that," but if you go back and read financial history, it's so clear. Yeah. So that was a great observation on your part. Oh, it was. Well, I was listening to you, Bill. Um, I want to go back to the economy. I heard you also say earlier, um, stagflation is more of that base case outlook. But just looking at the economy today and more of that underlying health of the economy, um, is it such a healthy economy? Especially if we no, not really. Yeah. I mean, if you have money and you have assets, it's been way better. If you are um, uh, earlier in your career or um, uh, uh, not lucky enough to go into a company that will provide stock options or not lucky enough to be a financial operator like guys like me, the economy has been much worse. If you have to live on a paycheck that's not juiced with options, it's been very difficult. And there's a, and people have jobs, but making ends meet is, is, is a problem. And, and you can see that starting to show up in various kinds of credit card data and um, uh, delayed rents and things like that, uh, foreclosures. So um, it's not a strong economy, but it, it's not it's not like um, feeding on itself, going uh, uh, getting weaker as well. We don't have enough rot that's burst into the scene or we haven't had a financial accident. A lot of times what the financial markets do is they in fact impact psychology. So people think, Ooh, something bad's happening. Maybe I better be careful. And the, collectively, if the whole nation does that, then things contract even more. So we haven't had anything to really disrupt the continuity of bullish thought yet. When I heard you say stagflation earlier, okay, so slower growth, higher inflation. I want to hear more on that. Um, and it sounds like this fight against inflation, it's, it's, well, I guess it hasn't been so successful. It's still, we're still inflation is going to continue to be a problem. Here's the here's the problem. When people said transitory, that led other people to think, well, whatever the price hike is, it, it'll happen and then it'll go away. Mm-hmm. But that's not what happened. What happened was the rate of inflation, I'm going to make a number up, ratcheted up to say 
and then it came back to zero. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to distort this for the example. But th that meant the rate of increase went to zero after going up 10%. The prices never came down. And so the idiots at the central bank kept saying transitory, transitory, transitory. Yeah, but they don't, this I mean, they don't understand inflation. Just because the rate of in, the rate of increase, a rapid rate of increase might be transitory, doesn't mean what you did to people's purchasing power is transitory, nor more importantly, what that did to their state of mind and their expectations for the future. I used to talk about this a lot before psychology changed in the last couple of years in the 2021 20, period when rates were zero or below zero, I kept saying people didn't under, that were underestimating or didn't understand the power of the perception that people have and how that impacts what they do. So now the Fed's basically declared victory as though inflation is going to stay at their two, magic 2% 2 number. But here, that's adding 2% on top of what's already happened. And there's a, in my opinion, there's a, there's a decent chance, depending on how the economy bounces around, that you know, somewhere down, down the road, that two, two number will be three or three or four or whatever. Um, so, uh, there again, it gets back to the fact that the Fed has give, been given all this credibility when they've demonstrated that they, they did, that they deserve none of it. They didn't, uh, they haven't understood any phenomenon of the last 25 years. All they know is, oh, big trouble. Let's cut rates. And let's, and then they never think about the kind. Look how long it took them to hike rates in this cycle and stop QE. And then they started QT, and then they had to water it down. And then Janet ran, ran, did an end run around around the QT by by break, by issuing fewer ten year bonds and more certain ninety day paper because that impacts asset markets less. So they they don't understand any of this. Uh, they're not going to to do the painful thing that would be required to break the back of this inflation psychology, which is now um, um, much more prevalent than before. Obviously, not everyone thinks that. There's a lot of smart people that think what I just said was dead wrong. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure Mike Green would disagree on me on that. And but we've disagreed about inflation for a while now. And, uh, you know that doesn't mean I'm going to be right. He's going to be wrong. I'm just I'm just saying I have a very strong point of view on this topic, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be right. Well, that's the thing that's so great about, um, you know, hosting this channel is I get to hear so many right. different viewpoints and opinions and theses. And let me let me ask you this. Um, the Fed losing credibility. This is a theme I've heard from many, many guests. So you're definitely not alone. Um, is there anything they could do in your mind to regain credibility? And if so, what would that look like? They're not going to do it. They, they, they have institutional no credibility. I mean, as an institution, they've got all these PhDs, they've got all these things, and they're- They're all Keynesians well, too, right? What's that? Aren't they all Keynesians? Most likely. I mean, they're all anti academia. See, until you run a business and had to lay people off or hire them or make really important decisions and having to cut back and all this, you learn about how things work and how human nature behaves and how the economy works when you have to make difficult decisions. It used to be to make, become wealthy, you had to make a lot of good decisions over time and ultimately it ended up with you being wealthy. In the uh, activist central bank era, all you got to do is be lucky enough to go to work, work the right company and have it get big enough to, and have the stock price get boosted by the passive bid and QE and you get rich by, by, by being a good salesman at Microsoft. But that doesn't mean you learned how things work, right? So the Fed's the same way. They don't. They don't understand how they. They're not. They're. They're. They're not going to be able to solve this problem. Just as the Fed from the '60s and '70s couldn't solve the problem until Volcker came in and slammed on the brakes, started targeting the money supply, basically constricted the amount of money printed, let rates go where they went. It broke the back of inflation. <clears throat> inflation psychology, but it took a while. Um, you know, they started to cut rates in 82, but by 84, people were convinced inflation was going to come back. Milton Friedman among them, who was a big, important person at the time. And the, and 10-year and, and rates backed up in 1984 to 14% when the underlying rate of inflation was 6 and headed lower. And they thought it was 6 headed higher. It was, you know, some things that had come along that had gone up in price that were rolling back over. I was very, I was very constructive in, in, at that period of time. 
Um, but that just goes to show you that the, the changing psychology in both directions takes time. And so there were there were there were two years after the Fed had cut rates and was doing a good job. People said, "Oh my God, this is going to." And wait, <clears throat> rates could never get that high now because the government could afford it and would cause so much havoc in the bot in, in the banking system and the and the stock market that we'd have break. You know, the, at some point the Fed's going to have to face that music. Um, but there's I mean, they, they, they're, the present structure of the Fed and the people there. There's no chance. There's no chance that they're going to figure out how to do the right thing. There's no pressure on them to do it. People still act like they're great, and even though the bond market's backed up a little bit since they cut, you no, know, you know, the market stock market's up, and the economy's kind of okay if you have money. Um, and so there's no pressure on them to to say, "Geez, what did we do wrong?" And if you read the minutes back from the periods, like I quoted a lot of them in my book, during those crazes, they were clueless. They would have conversations about stuff, about events that were going on. And they had no concept of what it might lead to. Like they're completely bereft of financial history. You'd have to make them all read a handful of really solid financial history books to understand how these things work to maybe get them to appreciate trying to do the right thing. They're all a bunch, they, they're, they're, all, they're, they're, all, they're all running on the applause meter, just like Greenspan. They like to give up, make these speeches and move markets and get yucks. I mean, they're despicable in life. I mean, the damage they've done is immense. Yeah. Going back to like the opening question, um, do you think the rate cut last week was was that a mistake? Yeah, I think it was. Well, it depends on what your goal is. I mean, if your goal is to to stop this hand kicking and money printing, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that that rates are where they ought to be. We don't know because we don't have a free market in rates because it's all kind of moved around by the by the Fed. Now, maybe the free market's going to start to speak, like I'm talking about taking away the printing press. But I don't think they should have cut, not because the the economic news of the day wouldn't have allowed for that. It's because of what happened before that and what's liable to come next. And and with again, you have to understand the asset markets. I mean, the S and P is basically at an all time high. I mean, there's no signs of real financial stress, so they're always erring on the side of being easy. Um, you know, Powell's rapid rate hikes now standing, but they looked like fools then, and they were basically trying to save face. Was like they said, "Oh my God, we've done the wrong thing." They're just they're get tired of getting laughed at. I mean, that's that's my that's my impression. So, um, no, I don't think you should cut rates. Cer- certainly not fifty basis points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just curious. Okay, we have the election coming up. You said earlier that that could certainly, and I, I, I think a lot of people feel this way, could be a market moving event. Um, however you want to take this question or wherever you want to go with it. But how are you thinking about the election, which is just probably, I think, six weeks away now at this point? Yeah. Well, what I've said last week, some 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 of uh, my readers, um, if you told me who was going to win, I wouldn't know what market would do what. Hmm. Now, that seems kind of crazy given the, the, the radical difference between the two um, contestants, shall we say. Um, but I, 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 you know, um, uh, you know, I, it, it seems rather uh, obvious that, that that neither would be inclined to r- r- rein in the budget deficit. Um, but um, without getting political about this, I think there's there's no question that the policies of of uh, the vice president would be much more towards uh, socialism rather than capitalism, and you wouldn't think that'd be good for markets, but. So I don't really know. I think it's good. I think it's 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 a very big deal. But again, you you can't trust the signals that we see in the market because of the warpage, right? Uh, you know, the things I've talked about. Um, so I think that um, it's a very big deal. I don't know. Uh, um, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know who will win, and I don't really know how the markets will respond. I think there's a chance it could be perceived negatively because whichever side loses. Is going to be really unhappy, and there's going to be all kind of acrimony, just like there was when Trump won in 16, when he lost in 20. Both sides, both sides, you know, have done a fair amount of yelling about. So uh, it's going to. I think it's going to be a very uh, distressing period in, you know, from a from a from a societal standpoint, and that sh- that could spill over to the markets, particularly if if it's close. If one side wins big, that might be a little bit better. Uh, in terms of society, but I I don't really know. Yeah, 
uh, I don't, none of us do as, as well. Um, another topic uh, you brought up earlier, but um, gold has done quite well. Well, maybe I'll just ask you this because I know you like gold and it has done well. It's uh, 26, north of 2,600 today. It's a very popular topic on this channel. A lot of folks want to know about it. Um, I know you like gold. How are you thinking about positioning? Is there any color you could give us on like, what do you like right now? What do you well, dislike? Um, how are you thinking about? Obviously, yeah, obviously gold's done, done, done a lot better. It's done quite a bit, done quite well since we were spoke in April. I, don't, I think the pressure is to the upside for the reasons I've already described. Um, Americans still aren't really involved, American investors. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the strength of gold has been central banks, um, Asia, China, and India. And um, um, so we haven't really done much as investors. So that wave comes along and pushes a lot higher. I mean, it's, 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 so I think the pressures to the upside, I don't know where it can go price wise. Um, I think if it was to, you know, have a strong pullback, I think it would be bought aggressively. So I don't think it's done going up. The, I have a handful of mining companies that I like that mostly done pretty well. Um, uh, so I think there's, 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 it's, there's still pressure to the upside. At some point down the road, hopefully if the if the if i'm right about my thesis somewhere down the road it'll, it'll, it'll make sense to sell gold oriented positions and buy fixed income because people will have their faith in gold and they'll have no faith in the central bank and then i'll want to make then i'll want to swap ideas so when the bond market finally decides it doesn't doesn't distrust the fed then i'm interested in buying bonds and i will be willing to let go of some some gold oriented positions got it um I'm going to come back to that as well. Okay, so a couple of other things that have happened since we last had you on that I'm just pretty keen to get your take on. Um, we had the um, Japanese yen carry trade unwind. When was that? August now, six weeks ago-ish? Uh, I, I think it was in July, but in my July, I, time flies. I can't even place the time, but several weeks ago at this point. Um, I want to get your take on the carry trade unwind um is that a taste of what's to come or is that just kind of settled and not and no there, to there's, gonna be, there's gonna be continued pressure to the upside on the yen because the, the the japanese society at the margin you know sold yen bought dollars and bought stocks or bonds and, and other different things like that so where we had the hot money that was in the yen carry trade, the, the, the bulk of that probably got blown up because the size of the movie, the FX was so huge. There will be an undertow on pre creating pressure on the upside to the yen. So I think the yen is headed higher versus the dollar. I don't know that as that happens, there necessarily has to be more blowups along the way. I think you probably got a lot of the hot money on that last big swoon because the way asset prices moved too. So I think I think I think the yen is unique is positioned to do well against the dollar. Um, I, I don't know that it has to bring lots of turmoil. It might, but I don't see any reason why it absolutely has to. What about your more of your outlook on the dollar? Well, as I said earlier, all the central banks are uh, kind of at the same flavor and the same level of their responsibility. So I think that the uh, that that that. that there's no really a sound currency. The yen is going to be the closest that come that comes to that for a while. Um, so I, I think the dollar can be we will be weak simply because it's been strong. And I don't know the election. Whoever wins, may, people may decide to look at the dollar differently one way or the other. I don't know, <clears throat> you know. So, uh, but I think that I think the pressure will be on the dollar to the downside. Although I think there'll be more pressure to the on the downside of the dollar versus goods and services than there necessarily will be against other pieces of colored paper. And that's why gold is the king of all currency. I think I wrote down that earlier. Right, right. I mean, people yeah. can see why. I mean, because they can't print it. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody knows the exact price of where, you know, interest rates or currency should trade, but we've seen the fallacy, the, the feebleness of the central bankers and they can't print gold. And so now gold is, is, is that's why gold's done so well is because you're starting to see the lack of trust in central banks. Mm hmm. Okay. If I don't ask you this, the commenters will definitely point it out. Um, silver, do you have a take there? Yeah, I think silver Silver is a volatile version of gold. And when the American public decides, hey, we need to get involved in this gold trade, it's working, they'll probably come for silver because they'll say, well, geez, 
gold's twenty six hundred dollars an ounce. Silver's only thirty, and you know I could buy more of that. And so silver will run when the public gets interested. And I think silver will go to a big price. I don't know what it's going to be. It you know because silver trades way different than gold, and it's mm-hmm. really it's really can be really quite squirrely. Squirrely. I mean. So I think I think I think it, percentage wise from here, at some point silver is going to go up a lot more than gold. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I really have enjoyed about this conversation is um, how you were explaining the thesis you have and the importance of building that framework and thesis as an investor. And so I imagine, Bill, um, there are things that you consider or factor into a thesis that could alter it or change it. Um, what would those be for you? Um, yeah, that might cause you to change your thesis or have to rethink it. Well, I mean, if the bond market starts to rally hard, you know, we get some economic weakness or stock market weakness, and and you know, over the next group of months, it, it may look like if this idea I have is still premature. So I'm not wedded to it because I don't have enough. It's a thesis. I don't see enough corroborating mm-hmm. information. Um, you know, uh, uh, so. If the, if the if if the, if the markets very different markets don't corroborate the things you think should happen, based on your theory or thesis, then you have to start saying, well, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe it's too early, or maybe I, maybe it's not right. I mean, you're happening to catch me in a moment where it seems to be working. You know, I've had many periods where it hasn't been working, so I know all about you know, you know, knowing it's and not. I mean, sorry, I know when I'm out of sync. Right now, I happen to be in sync. So that's the way it goes in investing. You have periods where you, you, everything you think seems to work really well, your losses are small, and then you have periods where you look like a dope every day. And that's the point I was making about Twitter. These the people are judging, people that have no experience are judging people with real experience and laughing at them because they're wrong, you know, for a period of time. And and that's the, and that's not how you go about getting better at this. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you're the one, you're in the arena too. And that's like all the credit to those who are in the arena, who put their um, theses out there, their ideas out there. Um, I'm not an investor, and I, but I have so much respect for the investors um, who come on this program and share their ideas with all of us and help us all learn. That's all we want to do at the end of the day is just like learn and get better and hear ideas. And so I, I'm appreciative fo- of folks like yourself, Bill. Um we were talking about the debt situation here in the U.S., north of $35 trillion. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert here, but I get kind of depressed every time I look at the debt clock, just t- t- taking higher because I just think like, what does that look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? I don't even know. But I, I just want to put the question to you. like, How do you think about our debt and our deficit issue here in the U.S.? And what does the end game there look like? Do you think it's something we can resolve or fix or solve for? Or we just kind of pass the point of no return. Well, we're we're not past the point. I'm not sure where the point of no return is. We could be well past it. Um, in that there's no I mean, the time to have settled up the some of the budget deficit problems was in 08, when the financial system was melting down and people were scared. And you could have gone and said, okay, we're gonna we're going we're gonna to means test social security or something like that. We're going to encourage um, drilling and natural gas. We're, we could have come up with policies and budget cuts, um, maybe uh, you know affect the tax code so real estate people couldn't swap without paying taxes. You know, gore everyone's ox a little bit. That 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 opportunity came and went. So I'll let your imagination run wild as to how bad things have to get before they're actually going to do something about the budget deficit. They will not do anything until there's serious pain and, and concern. You know, when will that be? I don't know. I mean, the first thing they may do is try yield curve control. I mean, it seems it seems crazy, but it's 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 been done in the past and Japan just got done doing it. So they might try that. I don't know. It's going to take real pain, real fear to get anyone to, to get even close when you look at how inept the Congress is on both sides, you just have to. I mean, they can't even they can't even agree to. Cl- I, mean, I don't want to get into the politics of the border stuff, so, but you can just imagine how difficult it's going to be to get them to address the budget deficit. So things are going to have to get much worse, and it's going to be very painful. I don't know when it's going to going to come about and exactly how we'll get there. I just know we will get there. Yeah, yeah, I, and well, I have to say, I've really enjoyed having you back on. Um, I want to give you the final 
few minutes here. You can take as much time as you'd like um, to leave the audience with some parting thoughts. Could be something that we didn't bring up in this conversation or even something that you want to revisit. Um, and again, you can take as much time as you need. The floor is all yours, Bill. Yeah, I, I think um, I think the most useful thing that we really talked about, something I have never really talked about before, and that is the idea of coming up with a thesis or a theory about what you think might happen, whether at a company level or industry level or a macro level, and then trying to wait to see till you start to get confirmation uh, in various ways that you're right. And also how to go about extracting information from other people. Like I talked about how, you know, there's all, there's a lot of smart people on Twitter, for instance, or on YouTube. And, and you, you have the way to get the most out of them is to realize that this is food for thought. If you think some guy's going to give you an idea and, and you're always going to be able to get somebody's idea and buy it and make it work or short it and make it work, you're crazy. You have to learn how, how, how things work. How you, how, and, and you can get better by listening to people and developing your own theses and checking them. And you can't get emotionally tied to things. I mean, you have to learn to suppress your emotions. I mean, I've had horrible, horrible periods, right? And you just, you just gotta, you just gotta fight your way through them. Similarly, you can't get a fork. You fork, you can't have FOMO when things are going well. So you have to fight your own human nature. Uh, um, in those moments, and the and the tendency to want to like, okay, just give me the answer. Just tell me what stock to buy. I mean, you're never going to get good doing that stuff. So I think that some of those things are probably uh, uh, more important uh, than whatever my opinions might be about something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the importance of doing doing the work, um, doing your own homework. Okay, so before I let you go, um, let folks know where they can read more of your work. I know you've been blogging for years um, um, and uh, like every single day. And obviously you mentioned Twitter X and um, you're talking about financial history and having to understand a fi understanding of financial history. So maybe I'll slip this one in there, but do you have any book recommendations for the folks watching and listening books that maybe yeah. impacted you in your career? Yeah. Like I told you, Money of the Mind by Jim Grant. You could read my book about the Fed, Greenspan's Bubbles, The Age of Vineyards, the Federal Reserve. Uh, you can read... Um, only yesterday to give you a snapshot of what happened in 29. Uh, th those are those are a few good books, and th there, there are plenty of others. But um, but but th th those are good places to start to learn about topics that you don't know anything about that, that might matter. Um, you they folks can find me at FleckensteinCapital.com. I have a I have a website. I write a daily column. I answer questions. It's about 130 bucks a year. I'm also on Twitter at my handle's at FleckCap, um, and. Uh, so that, that, that's where people can find me. Bill Fleckenstein, president and founder of Fleckenstein Capital. Always, always a pleasure having you on the show. You are welcome on any time, Bill. Thanks again. Really appreciate you being so generous with your time, your knowledge, your wisdom, your ideas, all of the learning that you uh, help us do. Thanks again and be well until next time. Okay, Julia, thanks. It was fun. <laughs>